Okay, let's start with the first uh, scientific session. My name is Anton Arnold, and I will chair this session. It's a pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Eric Kalman from Ratzkes, and his talk is now approach to quantum. Uh, oh, how does this? Okay. <laughs> What's the approach to equilibrium in a quantum cat's model. Okay. What, what happened? Yeah, I was closing. Okay. okay here I, hope it, I hope it doesn't come back again. So we'll it's the quantum cat's model. Okay, Eric, please. Okay. You need the mic. No, no, I'll, I think not. Okay. So thank you, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be back here at another one of these great meetings, which I've enjoyed in many cities around, uh, around, around Europe and. Uh, Great to have it back again here in, in Lisbon. This is a joint work with Michael Loss, who is giving one of the talks. And so, right. and so we'll talk about what we're doing here now. I've talked about a, a versions of a quantum cat's model before. And one of the interesting issues is how to pass from the classical model, which many people here are familiar with, to a version of the quantum model. And in, in this model, we'll be doing it with Boltzmann statistics, which is appropriate for particles which are far apart. Um, incorporating statistics into it is another interesting issue, and I believe Bernd will talk about that today. But even at the level of the Boltzmann statistics, it's interesting how to quantize the model appropriately. And I think this is the version that will be presented here, is really the, the right version, and it's got some interesting challenges to it. And here it is. Okay, so let me start off with the classical Katz model, which everyone is, or many people here will be, be familiar with. So this is totally classical. And so in the Katz model, one has a system of n particles. I'm discussing it with one dimensional velocities. And we think of this as a spatially homogeneous gas of, of n particles. Okay, and then there's an evolution equation for the probability density of this vector. Okay. Now, you see what happens is that at random times, you pick a pair, i and j, of the particles. That's one upon n choose two for the different pairs Oops. one can pick. Okay. And then you swap, there's a rotation in here. So this is a rotation in the plane of vi and vj. So this conserves the sum of the squares of all the velocities. So the energy is conserved, and this is the Kolmogorov forward equation for a stochastic process, a random continuous state space Markov process. And it will, of course, stay on these energy surfaces. Okay, So there's a conserved quantity. It doesn't go over all, all the space. And, and this is what it is. So here is the loss term. Here's the gain term. These are the post-collisional velocities. And this is how the probability density e evolves. Okay, so. The pair collisions of molecules are properly described by quantum mechanics, and it's natural to ask how the quantum mechanical features can be incorporated into this, this type of model. Okay? And there's a good way to make, make the transition. There's an old approach to the, writing down classical mechanics that brings it as close as possible to the, the quantum mechanics. This was the Koopman von Neumann formalism, and one takes advantage of the fact that by Liouville's theorem, the flows on phase space conserve Liouville measure. So the, the flow gives you, a, you have a unitary flow on L2 of phase space. And from, from this point of view, one can get something which gets a little closer to quantum mechanics, and this will be our point of departure. Okay, so what we will do from the previous page, we'll introduce the Hilbert space L2 of Rn. So it's the phase space, but we have only, there's the trivial dependence on the position. So this is effectively the phase space. And then for each pair, we define a unitary operator, which is very is exactly what we had before. You take this function psi, you think of it as a, a hint to a wave function, and now the function on L2 of Rn, and you to apply this rotation to coordinates i and j through the angle theta. So that's what all the parameters here do. And this is clearly unitary. And then you can, to any probability density on Rn, you can associate this multiplication operator, which just takes a function in the Silbert space and multiplies it by this function f. Now, this, this operator is not a density matrix. It's not even compact. In fact, it, in general, this would be a, an unbounded positive operator. 
Okay. Nonetheless, it's easy to check just doing these things around that if you do this unitary evolution, this rho of f is rho of g, where g is just updated by this transformation. So what you're what you're doing here is just flowing the phase space density forward under this particle flow particle flow picture of the quantum mechanics. Okay, of classical mechanics. So if you take this expression which we had before, this rho sub f that appeared in the Katz equation and look at the corresponding row for it. I should probably put the row outside the whole thing, but it's hard to read. Anyway, what, the, what that translates into is this thing. You take the row of f, you apply, you conjugate by these unitary transformations, integrate over the angular parameter and average over the pairs, okay? And call that q of f, so q for collision operator. And then this is an, another way of writing the classical Katz equation. So this is entirely classical. It's just the same old Katz model that Katz wrote about in 1956, just dressed up in the Koopman von Neumann formalism for making the transition to a quantum version of it. Okay? So, right. Okay? So let me, it's a lot of words here, let me go back and look at this thing. Let me emphasize that when you, when you do, do this equation, there's an energy, okay? And the energy in kinetic theory is just the sum of the velocity squared, okay? Just the kinetic energy. So there's nothing that appears in the Boltzmann, in the, in the Hamiltonian. We talk about energy being conserved. It's not the energy that's responsible for the interactions which drive the collisions. That's buried in the collision process, that's buried in the Q. So the way to think about this thing when we do these U's is the U's are something like an S, S matrix. They summarize what happens rapidly. The collisions take place on a time scale which is much, much faster than the time scale of this process and are effectively instantaneous. And the U describes what happens to the phase place points before and after the collision. So it's just like the S matrix. It takes the input to the scattering and the output. So we're updating it by a full collision just like in the classical Katz model. Okay, so the, the energy is, is, the energy that's showing up in the, that's conserved, is just a simple sum of the velocity squared. Also in the Katz model, when I quantize it, it's going to be the same thing. This is not something trivial, it's just that again, you should think all the interaction which is actually driving the collisions is buried in these unitaries which show up in here. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Okay, so this is, this is it. So let's try to write this thing down. And here's the energy that we are talking about. So we have a, a Hilbert space. And we'll take this Hilbert space, the single particle Hilbert space, to be d-dimensional, finite dimensional. And the little h is the single particle Hilbert space. So there are d energy levels that a particle can occupy. And then the n-particle Hamiltonian is this thing. It's a sum of things of the identity tensor, the single particle Hamiltonian, and the I, which would be a J, indicates that this is in the Jth place. So this is just like the analog of sum over Vj squared. Just think of this as this kinetic energy, okay? And now we have the interaction comes in in these scattering operators here. So the possible binary collisions are encoded into a family of operators, unitaries, that depend on some parameter, and the basic requirement on these things, they will operate on the two particle space. And the basic requirement is that they can commute, these unitaries commute with this sum of the two particle energies. Okay? And so that's it. So now we're going to extend this U. Okay? So the, the, the U is operating only on two factors. Take I and J. It leaves all the other coordinates alone. It doesn't do anything to them. This is unlike some of the other models we looked at first. This really leaves the everything else alone. So it's a genuinely a two-particle two particle collision model. Okay? So tensor products of the identity. And so it commutes with the total energy because it doesn't affect anything. So the energy is just the sum over the energy of all the particles. This U, when you lift it up by the identity, it doesn't affect the particles that are not colliding. And it conserves the energy on the two-particle space. So it conserves the total energy, but much, much more, it conserves this two-particle energy, okay? So the analog of the collision operator is just this. You take an operator on the space. Now, this is an operator. You conjugate it by the unitaries, and you average over these things, okay? And then you get the quantum Katz-Master equation. So this is exactly the same formula which appeared on the classical 
page, except now the row is a density matrix, so it's not an unbounded positive operator, it's really a, the, the density matrix, okay? And, and this is the thing we want to study, okay? And now to study this, we need to put some, we need to specify what these uh, unitaries are going to be and what we can do with them, okay? So there are two basic conditions on this, this set of unitaries, and one is the identical particles. So again, these are just the unitaries acting on this H2 space, the two-particle space, and we want to have collisions between identical particles. So there's no difference between particle one colliding with particle two and particle two colliding with particle one. So that requires that this swap operator, which interchanges the order of two vectors in the tensor product space, that that operator commutes with the unitaries, the family of unitaries, in the sense that if there's somebody, for, for everything that's in this family, there's another guy that's in this family that represents the swapped operator, and this, it's given by some sigma prime, and so this map, right, so this is equal to another guy in the family, and the map from sigma to sigma prime leaves this measure mu invariant. Okay? Now, likewise, the time reversal invariance in quantum mechanics is given by taking the uh, Hermitian conjugate, okay? and we want, local reverse, local, we want a strong form of reversibility, which will correspond to time reversal invariance or reversibility of the stochastic process, and so we require something similar. You require that for each u in this thing, the adjoint of u also belongs to this family of collision, possible collisions. So the time reverse collision is possible, and it has the same probability, right? So this map, which takes you to the time reverse collision, leaves the basic reference measure invariant. Okay. So these are two sort of natural conditions on it. These are the, the basic things, and under that we have this quantum cat's master occasion. So this basic um, abbreviation, which will appear everywhere, is Q. KME, which is for quantum Katz master equation. And so it's the same formula which we had before. And since this equation has this simple loss term, which is a constant, okay, I should say something about the N here. This will be familiar from the, from the Katz model. It's there for the same reason. You recall there are N choose two pairs. So you pick each pair, one over N choose two times, but now each particle belongs to <coughs> belongs to n minus one pairs, okay? So if you just had average, if you just averaged over pairs, each particle would undergo a collision. Uh, it would take, well, n minus one units of time to do that, so we speed it up by a factor of n, and so this n speeds up the process in exactly the right way, so that as n goes off to infinity, particle, each particle collides in expected unit time. Okay? So it keeps the time, so that when we do this, there's a time scale which depends on n, and the time scale that's being kept fixed is the time between, the average time between collisions of any given particle. Okay? So that's what, it's sort of the right time scale for getting a kinetic picture out of this. Okay, good. So if you look at this PT, this PT is given by the sum of all of these maps. Now the Q's you recall from the formula for the Q, the Q is given by conjugating something by two unitaries. That's a completely positive map. And you average over these unitaries, that's a completely positive map. And taking powers of those is completely positive. So this gadget which shows up here is a semi-group of completely positive maps. Okay? Now, we, we make the bounded operators on our Hilbert space into a Hilbert space itself by equipping it with the Hilbert-Schmidt inner product. And we'll let phi dagger denote the adjoint of a linear map from bounded operators to bounded operators, sometimes called super operators in the physics literature. So this is what it is. And here's where we, we use these conditions. By the condition two in our collision specification, then each one of these guys is self-adjoint. Okay, which is this, and it's clear it's also unital. Now, if and if a op, if a map from B sub H to B sub H is, it, it's unital if and only if its adjoint preserves the trace. Okay, but this is self-adjoint, so it's not only unital. So if you conjugate the identity by 
by by two unitaries, by a unitary conjugate it, then you get the identity back again. So it certainly preserves the identity, and so it also preserves the trace. One can just see that directly. So this is a semi-group of what's known as quantum operations. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that we would like to study here. Okay, now let's look at the generator of this thing. And so we write this thing as the exponential of the generator L. And a general theorem of Lindblad says that this has the following form. Okay, you can write it down in terms of this so-called Lindblad representation for some finite set of vectors V here. And then using the self-adjointness, this can be further simplified to the following thing. Okay, so you can write it in terms of these repeated commutators with the VJ and the adjoint of VJ. And the thing to just to get across here is the, the taking, taking the commutator with a fixed operator is a derivation on the algebra of bounded operators. So you can think of this as somehow like a directional derivative in the direction VJ, VJ star. And this is a second one. So this is something this looks formally like, and the analogy can be pursued quite far. This is formally like some kind of a little Laplacian. So from this point of view, we can regard this equation b rho by dt, this, this, cat's, this is the cat's master equation written in this generator form. We can regard this as a sort of a quantum heat equation. And one of the, base, the basic question which we would like to understand much better, and a large part of which is still open in our work and other people's work, is to what extent can you pursue this analogy with the heat equation and use methods that have been developed for treating heat equations, also in the non-commutative setting, to analyze the rate of approach to equilibrium of these kinds of models. Okay? So I want to convince you there's a really close connection with what goes on on random walks on graphs and the heat equation, and that methods for those two kinds of subjects apply here. Okay? So if you keep the time under control because it's starting to be late. Good. Okay. So that's the thing. Okay? So when we're looking at the long term, long time behavior, er ergodicity is, is, a, is, a, is a crucial issue. And so to hope to get any kind of approach to equilibrium with a reasonable equilibrium that's easy to describe, uh, a natural thing to, we need to encode, we, we need to make sure we have enough collisions to make that happen. And we, at least when we look at the two particle space, if you look at all, you look, so this prime here means the commutators. So let's look at all of the operators on the two particle space that commute with all of our unitaries. Now, if you conjugate something that commutes with these two unitaries by these unitaries, the unitaries pass through and cancel out, you just get the identity. So anything which does that is going to be a conserved quantity on our evolution. The evolution doesn't change any of, of these things. So we're going to require that at the two particle space, we want, we've, we've built in the fact that energy is conserved. We would like energy to be the only conserved quantity at the two particle level. Okay, otherwise you have to worry about other things. So, so we want to have that happen. So the basic requirement is that this commutator consists exactly of operators rho of the form f of h2. They should be a function of the two particle Hamiltonian. Okay, now a natural question then is when does ergodicity at the level of two particles imply the level, the ergodicity at the level of n particles. And this is not always, okay? So there's extra, extra conditions come up in to here, okay? Now there is one good thing that's in, the, so speed up a little bit here. So you can analyze this. So what one would like to know is what is the space of steady states? Okay, so the steady state algebra is this S of, this S of n, the set of steady states. And the a sub n is the functions of the n particle Hamiltonian. And we'd like to know when these two things are equal. Because if the steady states, if the set of steady states is larger than a of n, then there are steady states which are not functions of the Hamiltonian. And they certainly cannot look like Gibbs states. OK? So the, the first thing that's easy to prove, fairly easy to prove, this comes from a paper of myself and Michael and Sal Carvalho a while back is that, in fact, this S of n is not just a subspace, it's a commutative subalgebra. And since it's a commutative subalgebra, it's like all commutative subalgebras on a separable von Neumann algebra, it is, act, it is generated by a single self-adjoint operator k, which can be some kind of refinement 
as H. And therefore, you can describe this algebra in terms of the spectral decomposition of this K of N. And OK, so one can analyze in complete detail when, when, right, OK, right. So, so on the basis of this, one can analyze in complete detail when, when you have this condition happening and, and when you don't. Okay, so we are going to now introduce the second big feature, and I can't do this on time, with a collision graph structure. And when we're analyzing the ergodicity and the rate of approach to equilibrium, the crucial thing to introduce is a graph st structure associated to, to the collision models. So here's how this goes. So we let these guys, psi 1 to psi d, be an orthonormal basis of H consisting of eigenvectors of the single particle Hamiltonian. So the Ej corresponds to Phij. Okay? And then we take multi-indices, alpha 1 to alpha n. Each one of these alphas is, indicates the energy level. There could be degeneracy at this stage. And then the total energy corresponding to a multi-index is the sum of these guys. And the big size of alpha is this tensor product. So this thing gives you an orthonormal basis of the end particle. So this diagonalizes the end particle Hilbert space. So these things are very easy to diagonalize. I mean, it's trivial. Why? Because there's no interaction. The interaction is encoded in the U's, but this, these, we don't have it. OK. So the set of multi-indices is made into a graph by introducing an adjacency relation. So two multi-indices are adjacent in case the following happens. OK. There's some pair. And the sum of the energies at the pair are the same. Okay? So you can change the indices in a single pair, but, the, but the, um, and all the others have to be equal. You can change the energies in a, sequel, in, in a single pair, but then the energies have to be conserved. Okay? So if we, we do this, then you can, here's the theorem about these minimal projections. The minimal projections in this space of steady states, these are the projections out of which you can build this operator K, which gives you all the steady states, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the connected components of the adjacency graph, which are given by these things over here. And you take the sum over the alphas in this connected component. So this is one of these connected components. So the long and short of it is here, this condition for ergodicity, for having all of the steady states be a function of the Hamiltonian, the energy only, is that these um, connected components of the adjacency graph, where the adjacency is given by here, correspond to the, eigen, the energy eigenspaces. If an eigenspace splits into several connected components, we don't have ergodicity, and otherwise you do. Okay, so that's what that is. That settles that part. Now, the collision model I want to briefly discuss, keeping track of these things, right? The collision model that we are in, have investigated here is a collision, the coll simplest collision model in this setting, which has, from the two particles, we average over all, mm -hmm, sorry, we, we average over all unitaries that commute with a two-particle Hamiltonian. So this is the U. This is very similar to what goes on in the Katz model. You, and we average over with respect to Haar measure. So in the regular Katz model, you take all the rotations, which conserve the energy, and you average uniformly with respect to theta. In the quantum model, there are a lot more variables, even if you just have two energy levels. So we average with respect to Haar measure over all these unitaries. Okay? And the U is just acting on the two-particle subspace. So this is the basic two-particle collision process that we are going to lift up and get the n-particle system for it too. Now, at this point, we need some extra sort of strong degeneracy to make good progress on, on this. So this. This would be generic. So if you take, if the, if you take, if you select your, your d energy levels from the real numbers sort of uniformly, then they are going to be linearly independent over the rationals, and these two conditions will be satisfied. OK, in any case, this is what we do. So if you take, if I have four energy levels, and the sum of these two is equal to the sum of those two, then these sets have to be the same. OK, so in other words, you can't have energy two and two and one and three. That would be two things adding up to four. So if there's one and three, then that's got to be the only thing which adds up to four. So the energies which add up to four are one and three and three and one. So the only way to add up to four is a swap. 
Okay, you can't have other more complicated things going on. And then for each n and each energy that's in the spectrum, then there has to be exactly one solution to these equations. If the sum of the occupation levels adds up to n, and the sum of the energies at those occupations adds up to E, there's just one solution. That means that the occupation levels, will, these Ks, will be kept the same by the evolution because the evolution preserves E and it preserves N, so it preserves the solution to these equations. Okay? So, um, right. So, if we've got strong degeneracy and I've got, oh, this should be a gamma and a delta or something, if I've got adjacent if I have adjacent vertices in this graph, then they differ by a pair transposition. That was what we explained before, only exchanging. And then it's easy to see what the valency is. So this is independent. It's, it's, it turns out to be the same. It just depends on the kappa. So these are all uniform graphs. The, the valency doesn't depend on the, on the edge. Okay. And now to express what goes on further, let me introduce these rank one operators. Now, since these guys were a basis for the n-particle Hilbert space, this family of rank one operators is a basis for the set of operators on this Hilbert space. And the operator Q turns out to have a fairly simple matrix expression in, in this basis. Let me get through to the end, okay? So we need this swap map, and I'll be able to formulate things too. So the swap map both is a set uh, on, this, on the graph itself, as a function on the graph and as an operator. So first, on the graph. So you take a vertex and you swap the m and n in vertices, leave all the others fixed. So that's a transformation on the graph. The same letter will represent the unitary operator, which operates on these guys by doing this thing to the indices. Okay? So that's the swap operator. And here's the key, the key lemma is if you take one of these basic elements here and you apply the Q to it, I'll put the N over N choose two here to simplify the right, you get this thing with the swap operator and a bunch of delta functions, okay, over here. Now notice that the gamma, so the, the, you only get an effect over here when the, if you're doing the M and N collision, the particles, the gamma has, the gamma M has to equal the delta M, and the gamma n has to equal to delta n. If they're different, then you don't get anything. You just get zero. So another way to write this is that. So this, this is sort of the, the key thing that's, that's going on. So the, the, part that, the part that shows up in the interaction, the, the, the vertices that move are the vertices where you have a coincidence of the two levels. Okay, but these two things are the same. And they just get swapped. So in other words, this one is 1, 3 and the other one is 1, 3, and then it's going to swap both of them. So they, they go in lockstep, okay? So this is, this is a calculation that one does, and, and that's the result of it. So there's this coincidence set, sorry, which is this, you break these things up. So this is the set where this guy equals that guy, and this is what I said before, this is just equal to zero if you're not in the coincidence set. Okay, so now to make sure we get things through, there is a... <laughs> Corresponding decomposition, so we try to explain this because this will show up in the other thing. You take a subset of N, this will be the set where, where the indices are the same. On the outside, you specify the exterior vertices, two configurations, and these are by definition not the same. Okay, So you can break up the Hilbert space into all of these subspaces corresponding to these different sets where for this pair of indices, the two, in, in the set S, the two indices are the same, and outside they're different. So there's a direct sum decomposition, and each one of these, each one of these things is an invariant subspace under Q. Now the one that's the most interesting is the one where S is equal to 1 through N. So that means where all of the indices are the same. So this is the one that corresponds to these simple operators which are all diagonal. Right? So this is where all the indices are the same. So it's a product of rank one projections. This is not only a subspace, it's a commutative algebra. This is the classical algebra. Okay, and so this part is well understood. Um, so this is what lies behind that. Okay, good. So, okay. So now there's a map, because of this structure, there's a, a, a map from these graphs, so you, 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 you get a subgraph by considering the graph on the subset where they, all the things are the same. 
and you can map functions on the subgraph into operators as follows by just get this thing wrapped up. You, you, lift, you lift them up in, you can map these things into the unitary by a construction which we have here, okay, lifting these things up. And the long and short of it is, here's the graph Laplacian. This is a classical graph Laplacian. We're talking about functions on the graph, nothing quantum here. This is the graph Laplacian, okay? And this should be a Lapla graph Laplacian here, not just GM. This is delta sub GM. Here's the key point. If you look at this operator, if you take our generator gamma and you apply this unitary transformation that we described onto these subspaces over here, onto the graphs, it splits up into the graph Laplacian. There's a delta missing here, terrible. So a Laplacian delta sub GM is here, plus a constant. And the constant is positive. So when you do the time evolution, there's a negative sign here, the time evolution is governed by the graph Laplacian and it decays even faster. Okay, so this is now I can I see Anton is standing up and I'm getting close almost at the end of the slides here. So I can come right to the conclusion here. We skipped that's a lot of words. Okay, so the first thing is so, so we've related this spectral decomposition for the quantum cats model here to what goes on on this graph. This graph is studied in the combinatorics literature. It's known as the multi-slice. It's like the, if you had just two energy levels, it would be the sliced Boolean cube. Okay? But if you've got more energy levels, it's a more complicated object known as the multi-slice. And we'd like to know what is, the, what is the spectrum of this thing. So the top theorem that's here too, there I should have put a, a name with it. This theorem was recently proved by Filmus. Um, Michael and I gave a different, much simpler proof of this using ideas from the solution of the original Katz model before we knew about Filmus's work. But this theorem is, so, so Filmus completely diagonalized the graph Laplacian for the multi-slice. We have a much simpler approach which leads you directly to the spectral gap without, without finding every single eigenvector and every single eigenvalue. And so here's the amazing thing that as long as this occupation level, as long as there are at least two levels that are occupied, even by just one particle, right? So as long as you don't put all of the particles at a single energy level, in which case nothing can move, then the spectral gap is N in this normalization. It doesn't depend on any, uh, anything else about how you distribute the particles, okay? So that gives you a very clean picture of what that thing is. So that's good because that's what enables us, if you go, if you go let me go back quickly to our previous page, if we split this thing up, right, this, this gets split up into this thing with the subgraph, which depends on how with th this M is the cardinality of S, but so this just, the, we just care about what the spectral gap is in this thing, okay? And now there's this N here, but remember what we do is we rescale this thing by N choose two multiplied by N, so in the effective scaling, which I've skipped over in the previous slide, if for our purposes, the spectral gap in the cat's scaling is independent of n, right? It's independent of n, therefore it's also independent of n over here too. And the bottom line is that the spectral gap for this quantum cat's model is n over n minus one, that's an exact calculation for any non-trivial specification of the energy levels and and so that's what that thing is. So the spectral gap is independent of n and things approach zero exponentially fast, okay? So some other problems that are of interest in here, which are being, and this is the last slide that's before the thank you for your attention here. Um, in the, all of the problems that are of interest in the regular Katz model about approach to equilibrium are of interest here. In the other papers we've written, you can find a quantum uh, Katz, uh, Katz Boltzmann equation, there's propagation of chaos, this has been investigated. A uh, thing that is purely quantum mechanical is how fast entanglement gets eliminated by, by this process because the equilibrium states for this thing are completely entanglement free, they're separable, but that's probably another whole talk. So at this point here, um, I hope what I've described to you is an interesting version of a quantum Katz model. I hope I've explained how it relates to the classical model that many of you are familiar with. And, and I hope I've gotten across that there's a lot of structure about the generator. So the generator can be completely understood, which provides a good jumping off point for investigating further problems such as entropy production. In particular, there's an, and I'll stop with this, this theorem here about the spectral gap 
has been improved if you go to the classical sector, or the classical part, just the transposition walk and the multi-slice, Justin Celez recently proved a uh, hypercontract, a, a logarithmic Sobolev inequality for that, which is, as we, again, with the same independence of n on the products, and that can be leveraged into the quantum Katz model, too. So there are much, many interesting things which can be done, and the connection with what goes on in graph theory and people looking at um, random, yeah, random circuits is quite uh, lots of lots of interesting things to do. Okay, so at that point, thank you for your attention. I think I'm close to my 30 minutes with our late stuff. Thank you very much for your beautiful talk. We have time for one or two short questions. Um, thank you, Eric. Can you go back to the um, description of the LN with the Laplace with the graph Laplacian? Yes, so I may be, this might not make sense, but in, in the normal CATS um, model, the ergodicity comes from the fact that we're on a sphere. And here you have not exactly that, but you have this restriction of the energy must be determined uniquely, in a sense, in each, in each slice. I was wondering if some of the terms there can be understood geometrically as a curvature type of thing that comes from being on a similar idea to a sphere. Um, like uh, I think this 1 over a minus 1 is just a normalization coming from the number of particles. Mm, right, right, mm -hmm. right, the right. Extra mm -hmm. bits that are added, it, it's just like, I, I don't know if it's maybe like an extra. Well, this comes from the part, I mean, the, in the whole generator, there was a minus n part of the loss term. Yeah. And you, record, you, you recall that when I wrote down, there's a previous formula here, go back with all these delta functions in it. So in the gain term, when you have things which are not equal, indices are not equal, you just get zero. Mm -hmm. So there are a bunch of things in the loss term. <laughs> See, if, if you're in the classical sector and all the indices are the same, so everything is just a rank one projection with the two indices equal, then everything goes through, there's a gain term and the loss term. But there's extra stuff in the loss term because the loss term is still there. So you subtract it off, but, but the gain term is smaller and smaller. So if these gamma and j's have a smaller coincidence set, the gain term is tinier and tinier, but the loss term is still there. So the, the quantum sector gets washed out exponentially faster than this thing. So morally what goes on, and in a simpler model that we looked at earlier, this happened really fast and we could analyze things completely, but that, that's what these guys are expressing is that <coughs> is that this is the extra decay in the, in the quantum sector. If you're in the classical sector, the R is zero, and, and then what you have is that the generator corresponds exactly to this, to the graph flock. Now, the graph then splits into these slices, and the slices on the multi-slice are exactly like these shells in, in the sphere, and then you restrict it to these things. And the amazing thing that happens in the Katz model for Maxwellian molecules is that it doesn't depend on the radius of the sphere. It doesn't depend on the energy. The gap is independent of which slice you're on in these terms of these spherical slices. That's what, exactly what happens in the random transposition model, and it took a while for people to understand, but it, and that's what shows up in the next slide, was that this spectral gap is independent of which slice you're on. So you restrict this to the slices to get what goes on in, in that model. And now what you ask about the curvature is of great interest because, okay, but I'll, I'll try to keep this really short. I mean, there work, there's been a lot of work on these quantum, uh, <coughs> quantum uh, Langevin type equations here and how fast they approach the equilibrium. And there's been a lot of work on how do you adapt Bakri Emery type methods for proving this using a curvature condition. And there's been a lot of re recent progress in, in this by some people who were at IST. Uh, Melchior Wirth and Haonan Zhang, and they've done very interesting things lately. The tools don't seem, as they're in this current state, they don't seem to apply to these models yet, or at least no one has found a way to do them. But this is, this is probably the, a really interesting open problem, is how to use back re -em This is a heat equation. So I emphasize that, and that was what, that's, that's what it's there for. This is a kind of heat equation, a non-commutative heat equation. And what we would really like to understand is, is how do you do back re -em type arguments to get entropy decay? Okay. And so that's your question is very good and right on target with something we'd like to do, but I can't tell you how to do it yet. Okay, so thank you very much again.